Good evening, everybody. This is Josh Placer from GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games. Welcome to another great episode of the Perceptive Podcast. For tonight's cast, we are talking to another indie developer. This time, we're going to be talking about the topics of RPG design with his game, Zavik Tower, which is currently available on Steam. And I'm sure we're going to have a great discussion about RPG design, especially given how many subtle nuances and interesting mechanics you can find in there. But let's welcome him to tonight's cast. So, please welcome from Batholith Entertainment, Chris McAlay. Hey Josh, how are you? I am doing great. How are you doing, Chris? Doing well, doing well. It is great to have you on tonight. We've been getting so many guests lately that it's always great to talk to just about everyone pretty much interested in game design in the industry. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, it's always fun to do uh, do a podcast. Definitely. So to get the ball rolling then, Chris, as this is your first time on the cast, if you wouldn't mind telling everyone a little bit about yourself and kind of like your background with game development. Yeah, so uh, my name is Chris McCauley, and uh, I'm the owner of Bath & Entertainment. I've been making video games here and there, little side projects for fun for 10 years. Um, we have a couple games on Steam, um, one of them being Hydraulic Empire, the other is Avix Tower. Uh, it's just a, it's a great experience. I love the indie scene. Um, my background is in computer science. Uh, went to college at Cal State Fullerton, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, just love to play video games, love to make video games, you know, really a big fan of just about anything that's RPG-esque. Mm. So, yeah. Awesome. Besides the RPG genre, are there any other genres of games you like to play? Uh, strategy games, mm -hmm. RTSs, turn-based strategies like Civilization, um, Action RPGs, which is an RPG, but a little bit different sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. Really, anything that's not really first person. I'm not really a, <laughs> a huge first person fan past that, uh, which is funny because Evex Tower is first person, but it's turn based, so it's, mm -hmm. it's slow. Um, yeah, it's kind but, of. Yeah, first person shooters, I'm just not that great at, so I don't <laughs> play a whole lot of them. It's kind of interesting about that divide we see among fans. Either you're going to be a first person shooter fan and non rpg -er, or vice versa. And it's kind of fun to look at how much those genres have really intersected over the last few years with action elements in RPGs and RPG elements in action games. Right, yeah, like Borderlands, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, it's got really heavy RPG elements into more into that shooter genre, which which did very well and deserved to do very well because they did a good job of merging the two. Yeah, and there's of course. Call of Duty and other multiplayer shooters adding in like their whole RPG progression system to their games and just taking them to levels that really allow them to just keep building those games, you know, year by year. Yeah, persistence is huge. Even in a genre which doesn't need it, people mm -hmm. like to have something that they are earning or that they feel like is theirs when they're done with a game. Um, like yeah. the old Call of Duties, you would go on your multiplayer, mm -hmm. you'd play your game, and you were done. Yeah. And that was it. And you said, well, that was fun. That was awesome. But you didn't feel like a mm -hmm. month later that you had created anything versus mm -hmm. now, even with the shooter games, you end up with this sense of of account creation or, or uh, avatar creation in a way. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's good. Yeah, that level of like metagame progression or just that persistence mechanics have really been elevate a lot of genres especially the strategy and the role-playing genre chris have you ever played the um, etrian odyssey series i haven't oh man that's one you gotta check out it's basically a love letter to the days of wizardry and first person rpgs that's but, wizardry i've played all of <laughs> uh, and that's funny i have not played any of the wizardry games while i've played all the etrian odyssey games and it's very interesting to see how there's so many different examples or genre influences when we talk about RPGs. I mean, when you say – actually, I can go back to this. I spoke with Patrick Holloman, who runs the game design forum 
for those of you listening to this cast, it'll probably be about two, three months. For you, Chris, it'll probably be about three, four weeks in terms of when that cast went up. And we talked about the RPG genre at length and how it really has evolved in so many different ways that you really just you can't say RPG anymore because it's just too much of a blanket term. Yeah, absolutely. You're totally correct on that. Um, it's RPG is too broad of a stroke to paint anything with. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's mainly why you have a lot of sub categories like the CRPG, which is what this is, or you have action RPG, you have you know MMO RPG, you have just so many different things. But even in MMO RPG, it's too broad because you have things like Planet Side and stuff like that that are mm-hmm. MMOs. You have uh, you know two DMOs and three DMOs. You have lots of different things. So. The subcategory is very important when trying to define what kind of RPG you're dealing with. Yeah. And as we talked about a few minutes ago with sort of like the first person and action games getting those RPG mechanics, it's really, I think, affected or changed the audience. Like for me, for instance, I like playing RPGs. I've, like I said, I played Etrian Odyssey. I, of course, checked out Final Fantasy. But there are some games with RPG layers that have just they just don't hook me. Games like Skyrim, Fallout, and even something like the Bioware style games, like their recent ones like Dragon's Age, Mass Effect, etc. But it's again, it's just that there's so many different ways you can build an RPG these days. There really are. Yeah. Um, like I said, super broad, um, and that comes with the features are broad. You know, one may have talent trees, one may not. One may be just a, a solo character in a, in a solo world, as you're saying, like uh, your uh, your Skyrims and stuff like that, or your Bioware stuff. But um, you can also have RPGs that are multi-character. So, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very broad. And the, the feature set for each one is going to be very different. Or you could be taking the feature set of one style and trying to mix it with another style of RPG, which is actually what we did with Zavik's Tower Mm -hmm. to an extent. We took kind of those old school um, CRPGs and we added more modern elements to them, like, you know, a Diablo style loot, uh, Mm -hmm. like a talent tree um, system, like stuff like that to where uh, you end up with kind of a mix Mm -hmm. of more than one type of RPG. Yeah, and that is actually a good lead into this question I was going to ask you, Chris. One of the other elements of the RPG genre is that it really does have a legacy compared to a lot of other genres in the game industry. Obviously, anyone who plays an RPG knows of the days of Dungeons and Dragons and the height of the pen and paper genre, and how CRPGs and even we could say in relation JRPGs have as well have become popular by essentially making these games a lot more accessible or taking a lot of the decision-making or more the minutia and throwing it on the back end or engine. The whole Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale franchises were basically built as Dungeon and Dragon modules or campaigns that you could play without needing, you know, the whole setup, manual, the like. So I have a question. So my question for you, Chris, is, again, as someone who likes strategy and RPG games, do you prefer the older style RPGs where there is that level of minutia you have to deal with? Or do you find yourself sticking to more modern games or those that are more streamlined in how they approach these complexities? So I probably fall right in the middle, to mm-hmm. be honest. Um, I think that the more you remove, you remove the minutia, the less strategy you end up with. Mm-hmm. And since I'm a fan of strategy, I definitely want strategy to be in there. Um, I don't want you clicking the same button 500 times yeah. um, and then saying, look, I won. I, I prefer you to have to think about when you're ab- about playing. I prefer to think when I'm playing mm-hmm. um, and it to be a challenge for me. Um, it, it, hopefully there's a, a difficulty level somewhere in there that's challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also don't want to be dealing with rolling dice, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's that's too much for me. That's getting... I'll play the board game with my friends, sure. Yeah. But if I'm sitting down to my computer to play a video game, I would like some of that stuff abstracted away, which the vast majority of video games out there do. Yeah. Um, so kind of in the middle. Uh, that's that's the best I can say for me, my personal style. Um, mm-hmm. But 
definitely have to have some thinking and you also have to have enough streamlined to where you don't feel like it's a tedious process. Yeah. And that balance is probably one of the harder things to get right, especially, again, with re- releasing an RPG in today's market where that genre has just become so fragmented and varied compared to, again, like 15, 20 years ago, maybe even like 10 years ago, we could even say that much. And you are very much right about that, Chris, regarding if it's too uh, streamlined, then it's just I click button, people die, 10 hours later, the game's over, I win. And on the right. other hand, if it's too ab- or I'm sorry, if it's too much in the detail and minutia, it's like I can spend 40 minutes of battle planning every little detail out. If I don't calculate my exact hit chance and all that, I'm never going to win. And then it just drags that game on for who knows how many more extra hours. Yeah, uh, and you uh, you see that a lot in say some of the uh, the grand strategies that come out by mm-hmm. unfortunately the indie um, mm-hmm. that are trying to produce something that's a little deeper than say Civilization mm-hmm. um, Five, which is very deep. Uh, mm-hmm. And by the time this comes out, Civ uh, Civ Six, which I will happily take a few days off to go <laughs> and play. Um, but to be fair, Civilization is not the very deepest of mm-hmm. those those games, and um, but the struggle that some of those indie games have is they get too deep. They get so deep that in between turns you could be spending half hour, 45 minutes just coming up with what you're supposed to do before you push the end turn button again. Mm-hmm. And now, like you said, the game just goes on forever. And you may never finish one because you might get bored and move on to the next game yeah. before you get there. Um, so. I'm happy you brought up Civilization as well, Chris, because... The strategy John also has had this issue with these kinds of labels. Again, when you say strategy, we can talk about everything from Civilization, XCOM, Europa Universals, even like tactical strategy games as well. And I'm sure I've probably forgotten more than most people have actually played of those. But it's such a, again, it's another blanket term that becomes very difficult to properly nail down. And with those high level 4x strategy games i've definitely had trouble getting into those games uh, every one of my friends has you know spout, sprouted the love of europa universals or crusader kings 2 and those I are you. what i love those games yeah. <laughs> and like those are games that you can you get one of those games and that could be your game for like the next 5 to 6 months there's that much detail depth and replayability but on the flip side for someone new coming in it's basically like you're diving into a um the grand canyon filled with water in terms of trying to figure out what you're trying to do in those games yeah even being a veteran in the genre when i got uh europe universalis 4 uh i was doing some googling for sure. Mm-hmm. Just trying to figure out exactly what was going on. Um, once you get into it a little bit, though, once you can get your toe in, mm-hmm. um, it, it eases up pretty quick. Uh, but I would say, yeah, you're probably going to spend half hour, an hour just Googling the different things and kind of coming up with uh, a, a strategy of your own or binging, for that matter. You could you could definitely use Bing. Um, yeah. Not just Google, I guess. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, I hear you. They can get very tedious um, at times, and they can be very hard to get into. I agree with mm-hmm. you there. Um, I found that a lot of times it's very worth it. Mm-hmm. So struggling through a couple hours of, of figuring things out in those kinds of games can lead, lead to years of, mm-hmm. of uh, enjoyment. Yeah. And it goes back to what we were saying a few minutes ago. With that balance between streamline and complexity... A game like Europa Universalis 4 or Crusader Kings 2, you're not going to have the same play every time you play it. Even if you play the same country over and over again, these games can evolve in raggedy different ways, and that is definitely part of the appeal. And what we see in a lot of other strategy games, like we could say arguably high-level civilization play, can tend to become like standard build orders. And once you know exactly how to manipulate the AI and the mechanics, you can basically do pretty much the similar things each time you play to win. And there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean the game is bad. It's just 
they're basically dealing with different levels of abstraction and complexity. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say that's definitely true. A hundred percent for you know anything below like the top two levels of civilizations. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, difficulty level. When you get to those top two, though, you stop. You have to start planning. You have to scout a lot better, and you have to start planning your schedule, your your mm-hmm. your uh, your game a little bit more uh, to what's actually going on. But yeah, the AI is definitely manipulatable. But that's that's always the case. Yeah. Um. But yeah, you're you're right. It's a, it's definitely different. You have much more deep and much more shallow. And I'm not saying civilization shallow. It's probably in the middle, but it's mm-hmm. just not as deep as it goes. Um, yeah. And, so, yeah. And I think getting that, figuring out what is, I guess, your complete experience or your, how, quote unquote, how the game is meant to be played, that we see a lot of strategy and RPG games tend to have, like when you start dealing with like three to five different difficulty settings, you'll see like the game designer will point out, okay, normal is what the game is supposed to be meant to be played. Easy is for new players. Export is for the masochistic, insane players. And figuring out exactly how you want your game to be seen or be played by a majority of people is definitely one of those other challenges of the genre. And I guess for you, Chris, with Zabbix Tower, and we'll talk more about the game most likely in the next few minutes, but for that game, what kind of RPG fan are you aiming for? To be honest, I'm looking for uh, the RPG fan that pl- has played some of these, mm-hmm. but was looking for something a little bit more modern. Um, because this genre, until Legends of Grimrock came mm-hmm. out uh, a few years back, was pretty well dead since 2000. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's been it was dead for a decade, and a lot of people like myself were always kind of looking for something to fill that void. Um, and just, it wasn't there. Uh, Grimrock came out and it's not nearly as modern as I would have hoped. I love the game. I finished it. i finished both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not, I'm not knocking Grimrock in any way, but it, it's using, it, it's a lot more standard from the old school with just like a, an update of the, the, the graphics. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would like to see um, the things like that we put into Zavix Tower. I, I like the grinding. So Grimrock doesn't really have any grinding. Mm-hmm. I've always liked grinding. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always liked gear upgrades. I've always liked feeling like a world is just full of gear everywhere, as opposed to um, even a lot of games that I loved, like Wizardry, where gear's there, but there's not really that much useful gear. Right? Mm-hmm. You get that one weapon, and you're like, well, I got it in the middle of the game, and I'm going to use it till the end of the game. Because this is just the best weapon in the game. Mm-hmm. Versus like in Diablo, yeah, okay, they're going to have some special weapons um, that are probably the best. But you can get those yellow weapons. They can have anything on them. They could be any kind of crazy combination that you might want. Um, I also like being able to build characters extraordinarily different. So mm-hmm. one class, you know, take two mages and one is completely different than the other. You can't even play them the same. Mm-hmm. I like that. I don't like feeling like there's only one way to build my character. Yes. So those are the kind of directions that we that I tried to go and that that you know, I worked hard to try to get to 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 feel correct. Now, mm-hmm. I'm not going to claim that my game is perfect, but I, I I feel like I succeeded in some of that. Mhm. Yeah, I think very interesting points, especially about the state of the quote unquote like dungeon crawl RPG genre. And um, let me just say again, you really need to play Etrian Odyssey then, especially the 3DS remakes of them, or the re- uh, I, yeah, they're considered remakes at this point, because I think they will scratch that itch very well. And I think you are right that for pretty much the thousands, it was a dead genre. This was the time where I think Bioware and again, sort of like that merging of RPG and action really started to take root. We saw everything from Knights of the Old Republic, The Witcher, Mass Effect, and probably a lot more, especially in the independent market, of these RPGs mixing action and RPG elements. And yeah. with like Etrian Odyssey, for instance, when the game was released, and 
I can't. I do not remember the exact release date off the top of my head. But when the first two thousand seven, I'm looking at the uh, Wikipedia page oh, thank you. as you speak. <laughs> <laughs> my God, I feel even. I feel old again. <laughs> but uh, when the game was released in two thousand seven, almost every website or every mainstream gaming site magazine who reviewed it gave it thumbs down, saying, "Oh, this is too hard. This is a game about grinding, and there's no, you know." action elements and it's a challenge and if you die you have to restart from a save point you know this game will never work it's horrible i think like ign gave it like a three or four out of ten i think nintendo gave it like a six at the time and the fan base including myself we love the game and then by the time it got to like episode to etronacy three the review started to change, saying, oh, this is a dungeon crawl game. Yeah, that's good. We'll, we'll get, <laughs> get a 7 or an 8 out of 10. <laughs> and, and it was just like a funny... And the thing is that the game has not changed. They're up to... If we count the re-release, I guess we're at six games of the main series by now. I think they're working on Etrian Odyssey 5 at the moment. And the the mechanics have not changed at all. Still first-person dungeon crawling. Still turn-based combat. But just the reception from people has been altered. And I think both Etrian Odyssey, Grimrock, and again, sort of this revival of these older genres and design has really helped things. Yeah. Um, I never saw this, but I, I didn't have a DS until I bought one for my son for Christmas last mm-hmm. year. So I'll have to uh, order these things. Um, I've been more on the, uh, the console and the, and mm-hmm. the computer yeah for gaming for me um but yeah i will definitely pick these up i love these kind of games dungeon crawlers are my uh my dirty little secret passion for (laughs) video games um you know like i said they were dead for so long i was still playing them i was just playing the old ones yeah (laughs) um yeah i mean they're great and i was so so psyched when i saw grimrock come out Mm -hmm. um it's kind of what led to this game was that I just was like, I really want to do one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, why didn't I think of doing this before kind of thing? And it wasn't really a me too thing. Cause we tried to make the game very different from what Grimrock is, but mm-hmm. uh, it was just one of those things where it welled up nicely inside and made me feel like we got to do that. That's gotta be, gotta be on our list of games to do. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying a few minutes ago regarding being in the middle of the row between the streamline and the depth, I think I'm with you there. I don't want to spend, you know, 50 minutes to an hour playing out, you know, two minutes of play, but I want to still be able to think, I still want to be able to essentially dig into these mechanics. It's one of the things I like about Etrian Odyssey, and it's what I like about when I generally play RPGs. It's one one of the things about the RPG genre, because it is some, so much built around abstraction and black and white mechanics, that if you're not really good at designing and balancing, it's very easy for a player to quote-unquote break your game. You know, they'll find the best combination of spells or the perfect way to grind levels or anything like that, and... For me, that's usually when I'm done playing an RPG kind of game. Like, if there is that break point, when I know that I can just do X, Y, and Z and I'm going to win every time, I just tend to just shut off from those types of games. Yeah, well, the the more you allow people to dig in, the more mm-hmm. that becomes a threat yeah. for sure. Um, and as hard as a developer may try, there's still going to be things that creep in that do that. Um, but yes, balance is key. It's very important. You know, mm-hmm. we, I've spent a lot of time in it and I wouldn't even say that we're completely balanced. You know, I do my best and we keep upping things and lowering things and making little changes here and there to try to keep it mm-hmm. in line. But when you have, like we do, over 100 skills, yeah. um, it quickly <laughs> can become uh, breakable. We have a guy actually on the Steam forums that, that keeps breaking it for me, which is great. I am mm-hmm. happy that he's doing it. And then, mm-hmm. you know, I come in behind him and fix <laughs> what he's breaking which is great yeah. you know that's that's what you need because you i play my games a certain way but i'm i make them so that i hope other people don't just play them mm-hmm. my way yeah. and so um with that comes like you're saying that this threat of uh, uh broken combinations mm-hmm. but you know in this world where we don't have to produce a perfect game on the first release mm-hmm. um in this patch and update uh 
gaming world, it at least makes it so that we can fix it. Yeah. And that is definitely a topic I want to talk more about in a few minutes. Um, one other game that just came to my mind that you probably want to Google as well. It's from similar developers of Etrian Odyssey. Um, I think it's called the Dark Tower for the DS. At the, no, yeah, I think for the DS. There's so <laughs> I've played so many games. It's like my encyclopedia gets jumbled up. That was even older, older school than Etrian Odyssey. There's no the dark? the dark Tower, I believe. Towel? Tower. T-O-W-E-R. Tower. Got it. And that game went even far. Let me see. So make sure I've even got the right name. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The Dark Spire. <laughs> Tower, Spire. Spire. It's always tricky. Yeah, the Same Dark thing. Spire. Yeah. <laughs> and that went even further. And for me, I think that's when it went a little too far back in the old school. It, again, okay. they removed a, even more of like modern conveniences. There was no in-game map that you could have access to at all times. <laughs> That's harsh. Yeah, and with like the RPG genres, we've said um, what we were just talking about in terms of breaking and balancing these skills out. It's definitely very. I know there are players who will look at RPGs and they play them for. I don't want to say fun, but want, they play them less at the high level. There's people who will build, you know, their own little um, let's play or even like a little story around their character. So it's not about building the superb, you know, I will beat the game 100% with this exact build, but it's about telling a story. And I think that's the other side that has really helped the RPG genre remain popular these years is the storytelling side and obviously for anyone listening who's played pen and paper games i think you can definitely attest to that kind of appeal yeah definitely um there, there's upsides and downsides to everything right mm -hmm. so when you go pen and paper you're obviously you're obviously expecting a huge time sink from your players mm -hmm. um and an extraordinarily organized play style um you really limit your market at that point. Um, like when you have to bust out the, the graph paper mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're starting to draw in little symbols in every room that are your own design because they don't have symbols because it's not a, a standardized thing. And then you come back like three months later and you can't remember what that symbol <laughs> meant. Yes. Um, you know, there is a huge amount of fun that can be had and satisfaction. I would actually say the satisfaction for completing something in that is even greater. Mm -hmm. Um, but the amount of time you have to commit to get that satisfaction is, again, massive. Mm -hmm. Versus, we can all go all the way back to what we discussed a few minutes ago, the I push these three buttons, I win game. Mm -hmm. Okay, you beat the game. Mm -hmm. But did you really become satisfied by the game? Yeah. Did it, did it scratch the itch you were actually looking for? And it may have. Um, I'm not saying that that's wrong to make a game that way. But I, I feel that the satisfaction level is much smaller. And um, mm -hmm. when I complete a game, I want to feel like it satisfied whatever I was trying to get out of it. For instance, when I go to play, you know, Europa 4, I'm trying to have a deep thought invoking process in which I have to come up with tons of permeations in, in order to to do well. Um, mm -hmm. When I play something like uh, Diablo, I'm not looking for that kind of a deep experience. I'm looking to kill stuff and yeah. I'm looking to kill stuff quickly. If I'm playing something like I used to play a lot of WoW, I haven't played since, since Kata, but um, when I was playing that, I'm looking for kind of more of a social, but mm -hmm. still quite deep experience, you know? So each game is going to have a different experience that you're looking for. And you play that game, hopefully when you're, when you're in the mood for that kind of a thing. So there's, there's room for all kinds of games, but pen and paper, as dear as it is to my heart, I don't know that I could ever make a game that's quite that hardcore. It's just yeah. it's just too too much. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes also back to being appealing in the market as well. And that's one of the very big challenges of just about any indie developer out there is deciding just how is my game going to be received? And we've seen so many developers have trouble with getting their name out there, getting their game out there. And it goes back to, again, just what kind of game you're trying to make. 
the more unique or original it is, it becomes a harder sale compared to, you know, the umpteenth Call of Duty or another game like Diablo or even the platformer genre. And, you know, all three of those we could spend who knows how many hours talking about. Right. Now, I have one more RPG, I think, skill-related question that I have for you, Chris, and then we'll start to move into talking more about Zavix Tower. Okay. As we've said with balancing and designing an RPG, the amount of complexity there, especially when you start getting into the dozens if not hundreds of skills, combinations, tactics, whatever, becomes very daunting. And one area that we can see a lot of developers struggle with is when it comes to providing a challenge. Because you're basically giving the player, you know, carte blanche to build their parties however you like, it then becomes challenging to design adequate enemies or situations. If you make things too simple, then, you know, player can put together a party of four priests or, like, four of, like, the weakest characters and they'll just win. On the other hand, if you go too too specific or too powerful, then you create situations where if you don't have two fighters, one mage with fire skills, and one priest who has these four skills, this boss is unbeatable. And so my question for you, Chris, is in terms of that kind of design or balancing your game from a challenging standpoint, where do you stand in terms of like your philosophy or what you're putting into Zavix Tower? Yeah, so um, that's definitely a problem mm -hmm. for, for many, many RPGs, and, and you're totally correct there. Um, what we try to do, or what I try to do, I keep saying we, <laughs> it's just me, um, but uh, is is to to develop mobs, fights, skills, whichever one you're talking about at the time, because it's, it's actually, I look at them much the same, right? A mob is just a set of skills, really, mm -hmm. um, with, a, with maybe a special AI, hopefully. Um, and I try to develop each one of those with multiple ways to beat it, but not infinite ways to beat it. Mm -hmm. So um, also with classes, you want to create a class. Uh, no, no class should have a perfectly unique um, skill in such that it becomes required for a boss. Because mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you have to have that class. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is add things to each one of those. Like, so for our game, one example is, uh, you know, the priest has cleanse, which it can remove a, uh, a, a dot or debuff from one of your characters or removes a buff from a, a mob. Mm -hmm. Um, well, our shaman can just remove and our druid will, will soon, which when it comes out in a couple weeks, just be able to, um, so the shaman can just remove buffs and the druid will just be able to remove deep buffs. So anything that needs w to be removed. So if you have a boss and it has a skill that puts uh, a buff on one of its own characters and needs to be removed, mm -hmm. you can have one of two classes to get that off. Mm -hmm. And yes, maybe you can blow through it without getting it off, but you're going to have some kind of pain mm -hmm. associated with that fight. Um, so looking at individual skills, you want, to have either no bosses or, or, or mobs require that skill in order to beat, mm -hmm. or you just can't have a perfectly unique thing that only that class has. Yes. Um, and for a boss, I try to come up with three or four combinations that'll be able to beat it. So currently we have six classes. We'll have seven soon. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to get up to nine. But for the bosses, when I was making them, I was trying to think, hey, if I have this class and this class, this fight should be no no, no problem. Mm -hmm. So I have this class and this class, I'll still be able to beat it, but it'll be a little harder. Mm -hmm. If I have this class and this class, then, you know, again, still be able to beat it, it'll just be harder. I have to think a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so on and so forth. So different pairings to where if you have six characters, almost guaranteedly, unless you decide to take six of the same class, mm -hmm. you're going to end up with one of those pairs. You're just going to have to think about how do I use my classes yeah. in order to do that, mm -hmm. that boss's mechanic. Yeah. And that is a really good point there, Chris. I'm glad that you talk about that part. Going back to when I play like the Etrian Odyssey games, that's one of the things that really struck a chord with me is the fact that skills aren't unique to one class in the sense in terms of utility. 
So you don't have just one person who can heal or one person who can tank. Right. You can have someone who has a fire skill. Is it a fireball? No, but it does fire damage. So right. if you're running into enemies who are weak against fire, it's not like saying, oh, well, you didn't get your mage, you know, 40 hours ago, you're now screwed. If you have this, if you could have another way to get around it. And being able to have, like, that utility, I think, spread out among different classes, especially with a game like Zavix Tower or Etrianasi or any game that has essentially party creation, I think is very important for balancing and again to keep it so that someone isn't punished because they didn't know you threw in a a boss who uses poison 50 hours in and now your whole party is dead right another thing to fix that like for zavix tower is that um if you do happen to run into something that you're not prepared for you can have multiple characters back at town so Mm -hmm. you can have many more than just your original party sitting around and you can switch them in for your next run uh, mm-hmm. If for some reason you do run into that, because I, I have had people say, I can't beat the game with six warriors. And I <laughs> always try to respond, well, yeah. that's not exactly how I meant the game to be played. Um, you're welcome to try, mm-hmm. but, you know, removing debuffs is going to be difficult for you. I'm sorry. That's yeah. just, that's life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I had another guy, the guy that, I, that breaks the game for me. Um, he was like, you know, I'm running four priests and two paladins. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel like that's right. <laughs> and he was like, um, the priest is doing too much damage and here's why I think it is. And, you know, we went through and we mm-hmm. solved it. But, you know, that's once I do solve it, his game save's not dead. He can just go pick up his other characters that are sitting in his in his mm-hmm. end form. Yeah. So that's that's one of the solutions I also have to, to stop that from happening. Mm-hmm. And that is also another very tricky thing. I know. Uh, from playing the, the game The Darkest Dungeon and even watching high level play, there's a tendency to stack like different classes. So you would have two grave robbers or three paladins or three crusaders or, you know, very crazy builds when you start throwing in duplicates. And there's always that very weird balance. I've seen cases where, you know, someone with like in RPG may have like four archers or four mages and they'll just dominate. Or they'll build a crazy party. You just said, Chris, like six warriors. And it's like, well, I built this party. Why doesn't it work? Why isn't it getting me through the whole game? And it's always interesting to try and balance these different kinds of play styles. Because, again, if you give players options, they are going to try every single thing. They will. Absolutely. <laughs> to make sure that it works. I mean, I will give you an example of this from Etrian Odyssey. In the third game, I basically said to myself – I am not going to take the dedicated healer or mage class. I'm going to build a party out of all the other weirder and more unique classes in the game, and I want to see how far I could get with it. And I literally got to the final boss with a party that didn't have a quote-unquote healer or mage. And I thought, wow, that was awesome. I still got my ass kicked by the final boss, but for me, I tend, whenever I play an RPG... I always go for the stranger or the more niche classes. Like, just because I know of the holy trinity of warrior, mage, uh, healer, that kind of class system, Mm -hmm. that whenever I play an RPG, I want to go, I want to break that. I don't want to use that. And, like, with Diablo 3, for instance, my favorite class in that is the Witch Doctor. I am, like, I love, like, pet classes. I love classes that, again, it's not just about straight healing, melee, or spell damage. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's fun to have things that aren't as straightforward. Um, to me, that's what any hybrid class should be. Mm-hmm. Um, after you build your your standard classes or your base classes, which, like you said, is the Holy Trinity. You get mm-hmm. your warrior, your mage, and your priest, mm-hmm. and you can throw a rogue in there and say that's part of base classes oftentimes, too. Yeah. Um, once you build those into your game, hybrid classes should be some mixture of those, yeah, but with some uniqueness as well. Mm-hmm. Um, like in some games, you'll have a paladin that is, you know, more of a caster, mm-hmm. but wears armor. Yeah. In other games, it's more of a warrior that can still throw a heal. Yeah. Um, but 
where games fall short with that is oftentimes they'll make their hybrids classes much too strong Mm -hmm. rather than being, you know, 75% warrior and 25% healer. All of a sudden they become a hundred percent warrior and 50% healer. And all of a sudden they're, you know, they're 150% of your base classes. So you have to be really careful with those kinds of things Mm -hmm. or they'll do, they'll make them way too weak to where you just can't even use them. They're, they're so weak that they're a detriment just being in your party. Yeah. Um, Like, Oh, like going back to the pal example, he does far less damage than the warrior has can wear less armor and maybe his heal is maybe a fraction of that, what a priest can put out. Right. In which case he's just useless. Exactly. And, so that's that's the, the 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 funness of the hybrid class is that they're not nearly as straightforward, or they shouldn't be, mm-hmm. um, in my opinion. Yeah. The the difficulty from a design standpoint is just that they are the much harder classes to balance. They end up OP or underpowered too often. Mm-hmm. And then what we see another bit with that is that when you start going, as we said, with unique skills and unique viabilities or tactics like when you throw in a pet class in your game mm-hmm. or uh, someone who can raise the dead or buff and debuffs when you have those unique abilities it can all that also adds another layer to what it means to balance your game i've played rbgs in the past where <coughs> excuse me the debuffs were so powerful that they just rendered all the bosses you know like weak little kittens and so that made that you know preferred and then i played games there's of course the classic example from rpgs where all the debuffs don't do crap against bosses like if you've ever played like a jrpg yeah. like poison it's doesn't like, work everything. yeah <laughs> he just resists every single skill and then it's like why should i think about having 30 different skills when all i do is just hit attack kill the guy and move on to the next one right yeah that's the the buff debuff classes are definitely something you have to consider. Um, we have certain ones, for instance, that don't work on our bosses, but only stuns and disorients don't work on bosses. Everything else works. So um, we tried to move away from that. We don't like the idea that oh, this just all these things just don't work, or they're resisted so often that's not worth trying to cast them. Um, but mm-hmm. stunning a boss is a little bit too powerful because the boss is really supposed to do cool things. Yeah. So stunning them is kind of the compromise that we that I made and removed that ability. Um, it's one of the only things that says immune in the game. Mm-hmm. And with that kind of skill balance, it is very tricky because I know players who they see skills that don't work, they'll become very annoyed. And it really depends on the... I guess the level of utility you're trying to add in those skills. Like, going back to what you just said with, like, stunning enemies. If you put in enemies who are very powerful, that you either need defenses or some way to knock them out, then those stun skills can still serve some utility. But at the same time, I've seen many RPG and even, like, strategy RPG, sort of, you know, like, those hybrid games, tend to have trouble with creating, like, effective bosses like i'll give you an example um have you played ftl by any chance chris oh yeah and obviously you know about the final boss fight which is a set encounter with a three stage boss and Mm -hmm. when you have that fight because that boss in each one of his phases has set strategies or set ways of dealing damage it can make that fight seem very one note. If I know boss is going to do these three skills now, I know that if I don't have a way to either get around them or mitigate them, then I just basically automatically lose. And I've actually found myself specifically with FTL going through the whole game, realizing I didn't get the things I needed because it is random yeah. um, to beat the last boss and saying, well, it was a good run, but there's no really... There's not even yeah. a point to, to fight the boss right now. Yeah, me too. I've had that as well with a lot of my runs. I mean, I don't think I've actually ever been the game on normal, just because I never managed to get that lucky string of, you know, what items you need and whatnot. And I think going back to a game like Zavik's Tower in the RPG genre, when you have more of a open-ended kind of game where it's not just you must 
you will only play this for 40 minutes, and anything that happens in those 40 minutes is completely up for grabs. But when you say you can go at your own pace, and going back to what you were saying earlier with grinding, when it works like that and you're able to see that progression grow, it, I think it gives you more malleability in terms of designing fights and designing situations. It definitely does. Um, and in those cases, though, you have to be get very careful not to require too much. Yes from your players when they get to a boss just because you you don't know the amount of grinding that they've done mm -hmm. um and so there's this great unknown of how hard should this boss be that you need to have a lot of back and forth with the community mm -hmm. over the bosses um just because you don't know uh unlike with uh ftl there's a very specific you know amount of encounters that you've been to you know it ranges a little bit but it's not like well, this one I had seven times the encounters. No, you might have you know twenty or thirty percent more encounters than maybe your last run, but you're not talking about you know massive changes in the number of encounters. Whereas with Zavix Tower, you can exit the tower every time you get to the stairs, and you can redo the same level five hundred times if you wanted to mm -hmm. before you get to a boss. It would be awful tedious. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to do that myself, <laughs> but somebody might. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it's always tricky again getting that balance because the more variety and the more options you give the more permutations you essentially create in your game and there are so many examples of rpgs and even strategy games that tend to just bog down because of all those permutations when you can basically say anything can happen then you either need to account for everything or it's just not going to work out as intended well, I mean, you can't account for everything. Yeah. That's that. That's. But I, I know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I would say that instead of approaching a boss fight as here's what's intended, mm -hmm. I would say approaching it as here's what's possible yeah. is a better way. Mm -hmm. um, because I actually don't want the bosses to play out the same way each time. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I don't script their their capabilities. I give them their capabilities. I set an AI, mm -hmm. um, but I don't script what they're going to do. I want you to have to react to what they're doing. Knowing what they can do is wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, but having to see what they are going to do and what they are doing um, and it being different each time you play it adds a lot to a game. And therefore saying um, this is what I intend to happen for me and for Zavix Tower is would be would be a, a rough way to try to design the game. Mm -hmm. um, it's just there's too many possibilities to account for them all. So giving people a different experience each time so that there's no predetermined experience that I expect for them mm -hmm. um, means that there's a greater variance and people can enjoy that variance. variance. Yeah. And I think that's a good approach about giving – the boss enough tactics that they can essentially be different each time you play. So you, again, going back to what we were saying, it's not about I get to this boss and I know he's always going to do X, Y, and Z. So if I don't prepare for X, Y, and Z, then I lose. But if I do prepare for it, then the boss is just a cakewalk. Right. And that happens in a lot of the Final Fantasy games. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, So you go in and you say... 25 seconds in, the boss is going to cast this spell, and then he won't cast it again for another, you know, uh, 72 seconds or something. And, and you'll find their game, there's how to beat boss posts on YouTube saying exactly like the breakdown of when things are going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I find that to be not as fun. It's not bad. I play the Final Fantasy games, I enjoy them. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. It's just, I don't think it's the best way. Um, another game that falls into that trap, or at least used to, I don't know about the newer stuff, but is WoW, right? Like, mm -hmm. you go and you're like, oh, well, in 54 seconds, he's going to cast an AoE that if you're standing next to him, everybody dies. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> but I, I don't mind the skill. The skill's great, but what if it just wasn't on a 54-second timer, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as we we're saying, with, especially with RPGs and strategy games, whenever you put in linear elements to your mechanics or to how the game is played, you always run the risk of creating these set situations. If you yeah. know, as you were just saying, Chris, if you know the boss is always going to do his super AoE attack at 
25 seconds in, then the next one at a minute 25, that becomes a set plan. You've developed a set routine for this fight. And you can always beat the guy with a bot at that point. Yeah. And then, as we're saying, then once you start establishing these linear sets of actions, it can just essentially break a game, especially break an RPG or an abstraction level game. Right. Yep. Now, I think what's really great is we are almost an hour in and we haven't even really sat down and talked about Zavik's Tower yet. So <laughs> I think we could easily, um, we were talking about this before the cast, but Chris was saying if it's only 30 minutes, that's fine. If it's two hours, that's fine. If we don't start talking about Zavik's Tower, this will be like a four hour cast. I can easily feel that. Um, so <laughs> let's move on and let's focus a little bit more on Zavix tower. And then to wrap up the cast, I have a few questions regarding sort of your plan for the game in the coming weeks or even months, depending upon when this cast is actually posted. Okay. So as we talk about Zavix tower is a throwback to the old days of the first person dungeon crawler. We mentioned wizardry. I of course said Etrian Odyssey and stuff like that. So, in terms of, I guess, basic describing the game, is there anything else that we haven't mentioned yet that's unique to Zavix Tower that you want to bring up here? Yeah, so when we made, when I, when I made Zavix Tower and the artist made the art, um, the uh, that's why I keep saying we, because there's an <laughs> artist that does all the art. I don't do the art. I'm, I'm art broken. I can't, I can't do it. Um, we, we modeled it after your old school dungeon crawlers, which we've talked about, you know, mm-hmm. wizardry, the old sor- uh, swords and serpents games on like Nintendo, um, back in the day, that kind of thing. Um, but we also modeled it after a board game called dungeons. And mm-hmm. actually the original name of the board game was just dungeon. Um, but back in 1970, which is a game based on a board game based on D and D. Um, and, uh, the way that it plays out is each room has its own event denoted by a card. Um, and it's one and only one event in that room. And after you beat that room, you'll get some piece of loot or some benefit to you. Um, and so part of our game is modeled after that. Uh, as you said, you played a little bit, you know, that each room has something in it. Um, and then there's also hallways and stuff to make the dungeon more, uh, more varied. But when you come to a room and you go through a door, you have an event and we wanted that to be one to one um in that in that fashion and so yes old school dungeon crawler has the largest um influence on the game but that board game also has um a solid amount of of influence as well as modern rpg elements and when i say modern rpg elements I don't mean every RPG in the world. I've actually gotten some pushback on that. Um, well, there's this modern RPG that has this. And I'm like, well, but that's a classic RPG element. Just because mm-hmm. it's a recent game doesn't make it a modern element. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when I say modern elements, I'm talking about elements that that came about, say, at least in the late 90s, if not later, <laughs> um, and and didn't take root in, in you know, D&D and stuff like that in the initial like pen and paper days or even the very earliest video games. Um, So by an example would be a talent tree, right? Talent Mm -hmm. trees weren't, weren't around in the eighties. Yeah. That just wasn't a thing. Um, You know, uh, random loot that came about in the late nineties, stuff like that. Um, I also use class names that people should recognize. Um, Now I get some flack for that, but, Mm-hmm. When you play the game, you should recognize the different classes, even if you're not a huge RPG fan. Like we use Paladin, you know, we use Warrior, we use Mage, we use Priest. Yes, they're they're standard, and you could say that we weren't being creative when we when we named them. But when you come to the game, you should feel comfortable and not feel like you have to learn all about that class before you ever get started. The Priest you should know should be able to heal. Mm-hmm. You know, the Warrior you should know is probably going to use physical weapons and probably, you know, wear heavy armor and, and, and tank things. Um, so on and so forth. So Mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of the, the three pieces. So you got, you got old school dungeon crawlers, you've got the board game dungeons and then modern RPG elements is what we we modeled our game after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, like we're talking about like modern RPG elements, 
there's just so many games we can draw from. And I'm sure between the two of us, there's probably RPGs that we both have never even played before that someone oh, sure. could easily bring up saying, oh, well, why didn't you have this element from so-and-so? Right, and we didn't take all the elements. Mm-hmm. We just drew from a pool yeah. of all elements and to, to try to add in things that we felt fit. Mm-hmm. Now, with Zavix Tower itself, is the are the floors randomly or procedurally generated each time you go into the tower? So they're procedurally generated, mm-hmm. and random generation and procedurally generation are only slightly yeah. different. Um, random generation literally puts everything to an RNG role, mm-hmm. whereas procedural there are um, there are more there are rules about mm-hmm. what can and can't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a, we don't use a, a jillion of them. Um, it's still very different each time you play and mm-hmm. you probably won't even see the i hope the player doesn't see the rules maybe they will um but nobody's mentioned it to me mm-hmm. so far so that's good but uh definitely procedurally generated um and you should get a different floor every single time you play mm-hmm. uh, the odds of hitting the same floor twice are astronomical mm-hmm. and when you're playing Zevix tower i forgot to mentioned this earlier, but I think this is a good question to ask. Does the game feature I guess a very popular turn Iron Man rules? Like if your party gets wiped, are they dead for good? Or is there some leniency in that regard? So currently we only have the original mode out. I am right now hoping to be able to put in a uh, more hardcore mode, in which case anybody who dies has to be resurrected. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, right now, when your party wipes, one of your characters must be resurrected and drops all of his gear. Okay. So, um, now I have gotten plenty of feedback asking for a harder Mm -hmm. mode. Um, and so that is definitely on my to-do list and I really hope to be able to get to that. I'm not making any promises at this time because I have a lot of things to deal with, Mm -hmm. but, uh, that is a very, it's very high on my, I would really like to do list. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Iron Man mode is one of those very interesting things. I mean, uh, for me personally, I can only play Diablo 3 these days on hardcore mode because I need that extra edge to the game. But then there are some RPGs that I know that if I play this on hardcore mode, I would be throwing something out the window <laughs> if I at some point during this play. Right, And that's why you need both modes. Yeah. Um, for these kinds of, in my opinion, for these kinds of games. Um and uh, originally I hadn't planned one, and that, that's a shortcoming of mine there. Um, I should have. Mm-hmm. And that way I would have uh, built it in in a much nicer way, and that way it would have been easier to deal with. But mm-hmm. um, it is something I want to add, uh, the hardcore mode. Uh, I think it would bring a lot to the game. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I've gotten plenty of feedback asking for it, so the community obviously wants it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think another part of that is also how well you balance your game. I've played RPGs where the difference between success and failure can be a matter of seconds. Like, if you play, like, a very fast-paced ARPG, if you're not quick enough, you can easily die in any fight within seconds. Or if you lag. (laughs) Of course, lag. (laughs) Which is the most expensive. Most excruciating thing mm-hmm. is to just catch a random lag spike, let's say, because Windows start, starts to upgrade date on you. Mm-hmm. And you're like, no, mm-hmm. I was playing that character for 25 hours. Yeah. <laughs> and well, that kind of issue there, like if you're not properly prepared in terms of like how well or how far you want to take it, it can really make hardcore mode be so punishing that most people don't even want to deal with it. But on the other hand, if your game is so lax, you can it can also be like hardcore mode is really still just like a slightly rougher version of your softcore mode. And it's just a very interesting way when you're trying to balance your game around the fact that, oh, if you die, you know, it's all over kind of thing. Yeah, which is what most hard- hardcores are. Mm-hmm. And they, they, what hardcore also does is add a lot of replayability. Mm-hmm. Like you mentioned for Diablo 3, right? So most people don't reach max level with a hardcore character. Some people I'm sure do. Mm-hmm. You know, some really, really good people. Um, I usually don't. 
<laughs> I've, I, uh, uh, for me, I've made to the, I guess, level 70, but in terms of, I know people go, like, to Torment 10, you know, that kind of craziness, mm-hmm. I'm just like, nope, not doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I always end up with, like, a Meteor Prison dude, and then mm-hmm. I'm dead, and I'm like, damn it. Yeah. Uh. So, but that's just, yeah. I have made it to max, but not normally. Normally, my character dies beforehand, which which is fun, though, to me. Um, eventually, you know, I get mad and stop playing the game, but only after, you know, thoroughly itching the, 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 the scratch that I had for that type of gameplay. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's just very interesting in terms of that kind of design. And we'll talk more about, like, how you're playing on upgrading or changing Xavix Tower in a few minutes. Now, one other question I want to ask you that I'm curious about. With, like, a general, I guess, quote-unquote, playthrough of Xavix Tower, how long do you estimate it will take someone to, like, get through the game? Wow, that's a hard question to answer just because it it all depends on the amount of grinding that you do. Mm -hmm. Um, A five-floor run with a party that... Because the game is broken down into five floors. Mm -hmm. I guess I should mention that first. Mm -hmm. So... Each every five floors is a boss. So boss on five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Mm-hmm. If you beat the boss, you can start at the, from the town on the floor directly above the boss. So six, eleven, yeah. sixteen, so on and so forth. Um, so a five floor chunk with a party that is of appropriate level is probably about thirty minutes to fifty minutes mm-hmm. pending. Um, and when I say pending, it just depends on how fast you play. Right? If mm-hmm. you have a great grasp of the game, you're obviously going to play a little faster than in somebody who's still learning the game and um, and struggling through some of the decisions that may be out there. Um, being that there's 50 floors, and let's say that they're you know, 45 minutes, so in between the 30 and 50 minutes, um, per five-floor set, you're looking at about 450 minutes. What does that come out to? Seven and a half hours? Mm-hmm. Um straight through to 50 but you're gonna grind too i mean i know that for me i typically to get through a five floor set probably play the first level of the set and i'm ready to get out Mm -hmm. you know before dying (laughs) then i'll probably play one or two floors then slowly ramp up um probably four or five times in the dungeon per set of five i know i have people that have played for over 200 hours Mm mm-hmm um, because the the tower never ends, you can keep going, and there's a high score list so that you can kind of see in a high floor list both, mm-hmm. so you can see where you are in the greater community of how high people have gotten. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also have had people beat the game in you know thirty ish hours. Okay, that's about the fastest I've seen so far. All right, cool. Yeah, so with Zavix Tower, again, we've spent a lot of time talking about RPG design and how it relates both to the genre and to what you're going for with the game itself. In terms of, like, the mechanics or the game structure, are there any other elements or details that we haven't mentioned yet that you would like to bring up now, Chris? So we do have things that I call class synergies. Mm -hmm. Um, So... Things to where one class can't fully activate one of its talents, say, without another class helping it. Mm-hmm. Um, so one example of that would be that um, a rogue, and I actually can't activate this, but not fully, um, gets bonus damage on one of its abilities called backstab for the more bleeds that are on a target. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the rogue actually has, I believe, two bleeds. So he can buff it, but there are many classes out there that can add a bleed to a target and therefore buff that ability Mm -hmm. to very high levels. Um, Another one would be uh, mages doing more damage to frozen or frost uh, debuffed characters. Um, Mm -hmm. Warriors do more damage to stunned characters, Um, so on and so forth. So using different classes to... Buff's the wrong word, but to synergize with... To play off each other? Other classes, yeah. Um, which I know other games have done it. I'm not saying it's an original concept, but it's a it's a part that I take pride in. I really like that. I, I feel like it gives a lot more to the game if you really want to get into it. And you're going to do a lot better in the game if you do it. Um, you can play the game without it 
for the most part. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You're not going to get as high as the other people are in floor wise, but um, you definitely can play without it. Yeah. But it really adds to me personally a a, a tier or a layer of of flavor to the game that other many other games don't have. Yeah, and. Uh, that goes right back to, as we talk about, one of my favorite things about Etri and Odyssey and playing these RPGs is figuring out how all these systems work and how they're connected to each other. And as you just said, Chris, coming up with those synergies, figuring out, okay, if I have my warrior and rogue and I build them these two ways, they can play off of each other, and then they'll be able to do something like this. And when you start getting to that level of detail with your characters and your party designs, it, I think it really does add a lot to a dungeon crawler, or I should just say to an RPG, where it's not just about putting, you know, four people together, you know, pick a class with your eyes closed kind of thing. And you're actually right. saying, I want to build a party that, let's say, is all about buff and debuffs. Which classes am I going to pick? Which skills am I going to pick? And then how am I going to essentially uh, finagle all these things together so that it works? Right. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun on the game design side for that kind of stuff, I will say. It is one of the most, at least for me, enjoyable parts of building a game is being able to get to that level. Uh, because you don't get there right when you're starting the game. You know, you're... Dealing with just making sure that stuff starts showing up properly or in each system gets in and then finally you get to the end to where you can polish a little bit and say, hey, mm-hmm. what can we add to really, yeah. really bring out the, 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 the key points in this game? So mm-hmm. I love that kind of stuff. Definitely. All right. I think with that said, are there any more design topics relating to Zavix Tower that you want to bring up, Chris? Or uh, would you like to move on to, like, essentially, I guess, our final topic for today's cast? Yeah, we can move on. I think we've covered just about everything design-wise through other RPG topics Mm -hmm. that Zavix Tower kind of encompasses. We've covered a lot of topics. All right. So with that, the final topic, then, I think we'll be talking sort of about your plans both now and in the future for the game. I was checking the Steam page before the cast. So, Zavix Tower was official release in July, is that right? Yeah. And, sure was. And you guys went through an early access period, right? Sure did. Yeah, that started, boy, in March, I think. All right. So, I guess the first question then for you, Chris, and this is a question I like to ask a lot of the developers I have on. What did you think of developing your game through the early access period? I think for indie developers, it's almost a must. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't have enough testers and we don't have enough people. It doesn't matter how popular you are, how many friends you think you have. There are not enough people Mm -hmm. to test your game um, in your tight-knit little community um, in life. So uh, early access gives you that opportunity to to bring in feedback. And whereas you are going to get some people, and when I say some, I don't mean a lot. I mean some that are just mean and they they are going to make you feel bad that your game's not perfect. Um, you get a whole lot of people that really just want to help you and they, like I said, I have a person that just literally tries to break the game for me because he knows that he plays the game different than I do and, mm-hmm. and once he finds something, he knows that I'm going to spend some time to fix it. So um, early access in general is a great process and especially for indie developers it's something that's almost irreplaceable um it also gets you exposure i mean it's just there's so many many good things to it there's also a lot of developers that abuse it Mm -hmm. stay in early access for four or five years or whatever um Mm -hmm. and and i I think that's wrong but i don't know what steam would do to fix that so maybe impose a maximum link i don't know but um I think it's wonderful. I think the process, I did it with both of my games. This one, we stayed in early access a lot longer. Um, We went to four months. I know that's not really that long, but Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to one month. Um, But I don't ever want to be looked at as the developer who never comes out of early access. Mm -hmm. I want want to set an amount, and I said right at the beginning, I said, we're looking at about four months, ended up like four months and a week um, that we were in early access. And... uh, 
it's a great experience. It's really, really great, especially if you don't plan to need the money from early access. I would tell indie developers, don't plan on needing the money from early access to finish your game. Otherwise, you'll never finish most of the time. Um, one in, let's say, 50 games brings in a bunch of money in early access. All the rest of them just are gathering feedback, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we hear that a lot from other independent developers we've had on these casts. And you're right. Being able to get your game in front of so many eyes for pretty much like no real cost to yourself in the sense that you have to hire QA testers and stuff like that has become invaluable for a lot of early, for a lot of independent games, especially those that are built around either unique or highly replayable games when you have so many systems and elements it you know just as one person or like a group of 10 or 15 you're never going to be able to see all that and develop the game at the same time right totally agree now with the game being officially released in july i guess one question for you chris between the early access period and the game being released were there any major elements or major changes that you made that radically changed how Zavix Tower was from like the beginning of early access to either the end or retail? So just talking from one release to this next, early access to actual release, um, I don't think there was a single part of the game that didn't change. Mm-hmm. Um, well, honestly, we entered too early into early access. We probably should have waited at least another month. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were trying to get it out for GDC. Um, and so that led us to enter early access early. But we didn't even have hallways in the game, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, we only had four classes, but each class only had about 20 talent points to to spend. Um, mm-hmm. We only had, oh boy, I don't even remember exactly, but let's, let's say five or six skills per class, whereas now we're at 12 plus and 70 ish talent points spendable for each class. We're also at six classes, not four classes. Um, there are more events. I think when the game came out, it's hard to remember, but when the game came out in early access, I think there were just fights and shrines. I think that's it. So shrines give you mana or health or both back. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's all there was. Uh, there were probably a third of the mobs there currently are, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. Um, as for major like mechanics, uh, the speed mechanic that we use wasn't even in. We just assigned you a random slot and then you went in turn. Now you actually have speed, so speed plays a part into when you take your turn and how many turns you can, mm-hmm. how many times, how many actions you can take in a given turn, um, so on and so forth. So much. I mean, I, literally the entire game has changed. We didn't have any tutorials. We had f- much fewer tooltips. Our tooltips didn't work right all the time. Um, mm-hmm. So many things since early access came out. Yeah. And it's good to hear how many changes you've had and how it sounds like the game has really grown and become a lot better from getting into where it's at now. And I think it's interesting what you said, Chris, regarding it being a little too rough around the edges at the start. Because that's one of the more interesting issues we're hearing about with Early Access these days. Early Access is much like crowdfunding and Kickstarter, is that there is no quote-unquote standard for what will constitute a game like that. Like, we've seen games on Early Access that are like 80% of the way done, and they're just missing that fine-tuning. And then we've seen games that are literally, you know, the very first alpha being put on early access and they could have you know a year to maybe even three plus years of development left on this one game and it's just very tricky to know especially as a developer you know when is my game right to go on early access like you said there's no standard Mm -hmm. um my opinion and i'll be honest i even like i said i i think we were too early this time Mm -hmm. but um my opinion is you should have a game that is fun Mm -hmm. and that most people can play without it crashing Mm -hmm. um, before you go to early access. Uh, Now, I understand that that is generic as well, what I just said. Um, When I say ours went too early, 
uh, it just it crashed too much. Mm-hmm. There, there's no way for a small indie developer to test hardware well enough. Um, there are crashes that I simply could not duplicate mm-hmm. with the hardware I had. Yeah. And yes, they're fixed. They're gone. They're done. But I would have never known they were there. So those kinds of crashes are going to be there. But things like, hey, I used backstab and the game crashed. <laughs> That's got to be out. That's got to be gone. You've got to fix that up before you even think about going to early access because otherwise you're just going to get a bad set of reviews and you're going to you're going to have to fight your way back tooth and nail yes all the way and that's what happened to us i mean we went all the way down to 52 Mm percent mixed rating in steam to begin with um and a lot of those reviews are still on the game you know you can contact the people and say hey the game is better you want to try it again but they don't usually yeah um and so you're stuck with these reviews that have nothing to do with the game anymore so Mm -hmm. i would say be weary other indie devs out there When you're going to early access, if you go in too early, you are going to get stomped Mm -hmm. by the negative views, and and rightfully so, right? I would say that most of the negative views we got were earned at the time, Mm -hmm. Um, and most people won't give you a second chance. Yeah, That was your one chance. You blew it. Oops. Yeah, that, I think, is the um, smoking gun right there for... What it means to be selling these games on Steam and especially going on early access, you really only have one chance to make a good first impression. And then if you fail that, you either A, have to get really lucky or B, you have to work your ass off to essentially uh, rewrite or realign the ship in a sense. Yeah. And that's where we were. We updated the game a minimum of two times a week, mm-hmm. all except for last week, only because I was working on a on the, the new town questing system, which took forever. Mm-hmm. Um, since early access, there have been a mountain of updates. I actually don't even know how many there are. <laughs> There's so many of them. Um, but yeah, it's it's a big fight if you if you're not ready for it, and we weren't, yeah. and we paid the price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and. It's such a tricky thing because as we've said, and I'm sure as you're no doubt aware, Chris, every game is different. There is no manual for how to design a video game. And that means there are no standards for what is and what isn't considered either, you know, finish or part way or whatever. We've talked about this on the cast with many other developers that I think, as you said, Chris, in terms of when is a good time to go on early access or when is a good time to show your game, it should be at the point where someone can get an enjoyment out of it and that, you know, it's actually playable. Like, if you put your game on early access and person clicks start and the game crashes, that is just shooting yourself in the foot, you know, with like a rocket launcher. Now, I would say, though, when you said show game, I would say you want to do that as early as possible. Mm-hmm. But the people that you're just showing the game to should not be having to buy it. Yeah. Um, we, it is it is so valuable to get feedback before you think your game is ready. Yes. Um, it, first of all, you can stop developing something that's a train wreck. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't mean the whole game. I mean just like an individual system within the game mm-hmm. and fix it. Um, or... You could think that your one of your systems is junk, but everybody likes it. And you can say, oh, okay, well, mm-hmm. in that case, I'll leave it the way it is and not spend another month developing this this individual system inside this game because it's already where it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just so valuable. I would say, you know, the first time that you smile playing your game, you should probably then take it to other people and see if they smile. Mm-hmm. Because if they don't, then your bias is showing through and you need to, you need to continue thinking about what you're doing. But if they do, if they love what you've got, then you, you get a reference point. So you either get, you get feedback either way, but you either know that you need to change something or you know that you've got something good. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I say people grab your best friend, make them play it, Mm -hmm. you know, they're not going to be as harsh maybe as somebody else would be, but at least you're getting some feedback. Grab, you know, the, you know, one of the best ones for me, my mother hates playing video games, (laughs) But I make her play them because because she hates it. Mm-hmm. Not to be mean to my mom, but because she is not a video game player. And so I find things that just confuse the living crap out of her. And then I'm like, oh, I guess 
that's more confusing than I thought it was being somebody who's played video games since he was two years old, you know? Um, yeah. It's, it's a, just a different perspective. Grab these people, go find random people. Um, I took Zavik's tower to the mall literally <laughs> and sat there and had people play it. Um, that's a frustrating process, but you get a lot of feedback. Um, and even that wasn't enough feedback. We, we still weren't ready for early access. So mm -hmm. I can't stress how, how important it is to just get your game in front of people. Yeah. And we've had so many examples of developers saying just that. When I spoke with Tim Keenan, who worked on Duskers over this year, he said pretty much the same thing. Like there were things he would not have ever thought of or ever have seen that his that the people who were testing the game and looking at the early access were able to find. And they also mm -hmm. suggested elements that he would never have thought of or improvements on the game. Right. Yeah. It's it's huge. It feedback is so important. And if I don't know if you can still see what our, our post was for early access or not, but um in the top line was we're here for feedback. Like give it to us. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I think, and I'm, I'm 100% positive, the game has improved because of it. Mm -hmm. Now, as we talked about, the game has been released since July, and you have been working on it since then. Now, as of the time of this podcast, for those of you listening to it, you are planning another big update to the game for the end of September. If you wouldn't mind, for the folks listening, what else is coming to Zavik Tower? So today, actually, I just released Town Quests, mm -hmm. um, and it's not fully fleshed out, but it is a system in order to gather more resources more quickly, mm -hmm. um, which is in response to people requesting ways to get more resources more quickly. So that was actually a decent size upgrade just today, uh, update today. On the 23rd, I'm hoping, that is the planned date, and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm working my butt off to, to get there, but, uh, we are trying to release our seventh class, which is the Druid. Mm -hmm. um, and as we talked about with hybrid classes, they are very difficult to balance. So yeah. that's part of the issues that I'm having. I also want every class to feel special mm -hmm. and uh, feel like it plays different. And since we already have two hybrid classes, which is the Paladin and the Shaman currently, um, adding another hybrid class uh, comes with some challenges. You know, I don't want the Druid to just feel like a a shape-shifting paladin. Oh, I don't want it to feel like a shape-shifting shaman. I mm -hmm. want it to feel like it has its own place and its own reason for existing. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm succeeding with that so far, but I got a ways to go. Yeah. Um, and that is kind of the most important piece there. I also plan in that patch or before, sometimes I separate things out into smaller patches, mm -hmm. which I often do, um, fleshing out our rune system a little bit more which is on the doors it kind of changes how a fight would go and it tells you about that before you go in it's mm -hmm. a little rune on the door um as well as a uh, small up to the date to the item system just to have more different stats that show up you know all the base stats are what show up now but i want to add like specific resistances and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and like yeah just just more stats on the on the gear uh more different kinds of stats so those are the things that I'm trying to get to by the 23rd. We'll see how well it goes. Um, past that, we have two other classes we want to add. Um, I We talked about the hardcore mode that I would love to add that one. Like I said, I'm not making promises, but I would like to do it. It's really mm -hmm. something that as long as I don't go bankrupt before it, I will <laughs> want to add. Um, yeah. That, that's kind of where the game's going. More content. Wait, I do want to add a few more mobs. All the bosses are in that we're going to add for this current game. That doesn't mean we won't ever make an expansion or something sometime. Um, but that part is done, although the bosses constantly get edited. Uh, a few weeks ago, I added a couple skills to a couple different bosses that people felt were a little lackluster. So um, I do listen. I, I I want to hear what the community has to say, and I'm there to to work with you guys um it doesn't mean i'm gonna change every little thing because one person wants it but it does mean that i'm listening and um if you bring up a great point i'm i'm happy to work with you to work with the game 
So, all right. Now, looking into the future, then beyond the Druid update that you're planning, again for those of you listening to this cast, it should hopefully be out. But from beyond that point, do you see any new changes or additions to Zavik Tower, or is it still too much in the ether at the moment? Like I said, we're going to add more classes, more of the content we currently have. Um, whether we add like massive new systems or not really depends on on the budgets. And I know that sounds mm-hmm. like a cop out, but it, it is true. You yeah. know, we I do have to be able to live. You know, I've got kids, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, I have completed everything I had already set out. I originally set out to do already. Um, everything I'm adding now is just, uh, above and beyond scope. And I'd like to continue doing that. Um, and I'm trying to keep that kind of open. You said in the ether, sure. That's a good way to put it. Um, because I don't want to have a super specific set of things I want to do because then I won't listen to the community. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, yes, we'll update it. Yes. We'll move it on. Mm-hmm. It just, it really depends on, on how well we do. All right. And that's as much as you can really expect, especially with the state of developing a game in the indie space. We've seen some games that they can just come and go very quickly. And then we have games that if they hit that right niche or that, you know, like the perfect storm of marketing and interest, they can be supported for months, maybe even years. I mean, I've, I've been recently trying out Terraria, which, it's still being updated. There's still people loving that game. And then there's other independent games that they've unfortunately, for one reason or the other, they get maybe like a few patches and then, you know, they go, they just disappear, never to be seen again, unfortunately. Yeah, well, we've got more patches than that already, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, again, we are approaching, or we've probably just hit the hour and a half mark in terms of recording and again i think i can definitely tell talking to you chris we could be here for i don't know maybe four or five more hours we could easily (laughs) find things to talk about but i think it is about time to wrap things up so before we say goodbye are there i guess first off in terms of i guess marketing the game or your plans for it is there anything else that I haven't mentioned or I haven't asked that you would like to bring up now? Boy, we covered so much. Yeah. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I really, really can't come up with anything specific that wasn't covered. Okay. I know with these cats, we can hit so many different topics. It's not even funny. Yeah. All right. In that case, then, before we say goodbye, my final question for you then, Chris, is do you have any final thoughts or anything we'd like to say to fans listening? You know, essentially, the floor is yours. You know what? I just want to say thank you to everybody out there that has supported us, um, or, or me for that matter. Um, it, it really means the world to me. Um, this is my dream to do. Like, mm-hmm. nothing else in the world would I rather do than what I'm doing right now. Yeah. So um, even though I realize my games aren't perfect, um, mm-hmm. thank you for your support. And uh, I'll keep working on them, this one, and hopefully another one. So, you know, thank you. That's the best I can say. Cool. And I guess that actually just brings up one question I'd like to ask you, Chris. Do you currently have any plans for a game after Zavik Tower? Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, right now, I'm not 100% positive. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a few little prototypes that I've been working with right now. If I had to state what I think it'll be, it'll probably be some mix of like a city builder and a strategy game. Cool. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking currently. All right. So, I think with all that said, this has been a very great cast. Chris, it was a pleasure talking tonight, and I do wish you the best of luck with Zavik Tower. For those of you listening to the cast, if everyone plays their cards right in the we can get the scheduling done. There should be a live play of Zavik Tower that I'll be doing on Twitch and should be on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel by the time you're listening to this cast. With that said, we're going to wrap things up here for this episode of the Receptive Podcast. For those of you who've been listening to it, thanks so much for tuning in. If you'd like to support Game Wisdom, we have multiple options available. 
First, to write a guest piece for the site or be a future podcast guest, you can find information and links under Submissions Wanted on the front page. We are always looking for new people to talk to and connect with, so be sure to send us an email. Be sure to follow us on Twitch and Twitter under GW Bicer for the latest updates of new content, as well as thoughts from me throughout the day. Subscribe to the Game Wisdom YouTube channel to find daily videos of Let's Breaks, Indie Spotlights, Game Reviews, and my own personal vlog, where I talk about game design topics. Last but not least, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. You can find me on there under Game Wisdom. Your donations can help keep Game Wisdom supported, allow me to pay those annoying bills, and keep growing. If we can hit some of those goals, it will also mean more content for everyone to enjoy. So again, Chris, it has been a great pleasure talking to you today. And like I said, I wish you the best of luck with Zavik Tower. Thanks, Josh. It has been a lot of fun, and I wish you luck with uh, your endeavors as well. Thank you. So with all that said, thanks again for tuning in. Have a great rest of the week, and we will talk to you again next time. Take care. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, share with your friends. It always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at GWBicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.